Uh, Brad, this is Craig. Uh, are you ready for me to begin? Yeah, Craig, I, I believe so. If you're ready. OK, well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, being with us today. And uh, it probably goes without saying, you know, we are still using this uh, virtual uh, venue because of the situation with the uh, COVID pandemic that is uh, still going on. And I sure, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that um, we all had hoped that we would be beyond this by this point in time. But uh, unfortunately, it looks like we are into our third wave of the um, continued rise of the vari uh, virus. So we wish well to everyone, um, be safe, and hopefully we can um, get on top of this. Uh, again, I wanna welcome everybody here today, and this is the uh, Nebraska uh, State Technical Advisory Committee meeting. Um, we view these meetings as an important process for uh, stakeholders to learn firsthand about um, USDA plans for program deliveries and priorities. And then subsequently, it's uh, an excellent opportunity for stakeholders and partners to provide us uh, feedback on our plans for uh, program implementation and delivery. So we're glad to have you all here today. Um, you can see that we have a pretty full uh, agenda and um, activities to, to cover. Uh, we always have um, a quite a bit of information from Brad Songson, Assistant State Conservationist for Programs, and his staff to deliver. But um, today we have a nice mix of some other um, programs and activities. And we'll have a new staff person, our new state soil scientist, Carlos uh, Villarreal, to introduce to you. So I think without uh, further ado, Brad, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Craig. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. OK. Uh, Craig, can you see my uh, full uh, slide PowerPoint on your screen? I can if I can just find my mute button again, Brad. You're good to go. <laughs> OK, all right. OK, well, uh, as uh, as Craig mentioned, uh, we have I just want to give you some some updates on where we are with with some of the major uh, programs we have. Um, it's uh, proving to be another busy uh, year in, in uh, conservation programs. Uh, of course, uh, again with uh, with COVID and with with everything that's uh, all of all of those uh, uh, challenges that we have with the DHMs and everything. Uh, our field offices are still uh, working uh, to uh, get applications uh, to get those ranked. To get uh, and we're moving towards uh, you know obligations in early uh, calendar year 21. So um, just uh, like I say, I'll give a, kind of a quick update. Uh, I'll start with the conservation stewardship program and just to recap a little bit on uh, what what we did in in 2020. Again. Uh, uh, it, it continues to be a very popular uh, program here in Nebraska. Um, we're one of the, I'd say, top five or six states in the country when it comes to the number of applications we get each year, and that that has been the case, uh, uh, you know, for many years. So last year uh, we had 910 applications, and uh, you can see we ended up with 12.4 million dollars uh, to obligate which uh, only let us obligate 128 of those 910 applications. And so uh, the CSP continues to get more competitive. Um, the dollars which are allocated to Nebraska 
or less than it used to be. Um, we think um, some of the other states uh, are getting uh, they're getting more aggressive with CSP. So um, the dollars just don't go around like they used to. So that was our classic. Um, there was also grassland conservation uh, sign up last year. We got almost 200 contracts in that. And then uh, with CSP, uh, these are five year contracts. And as a reminder, um, the producers do have an option uh, to apply to renew uh, for another five years. It is a competitive process now. And so uh, uh, last year of 258 applications, we were able to approve 95 um, of those uh, 258. So um, there again, uh, it hasn't been too many years ago when uh, we would approve, we had enough money to basically approve about, about every application that we received. Uh, just uh, this is a, a slide I, I had from last September, but I just wanted to give you an update. This year, uh, we we moved up the the timeline to make our CSP annual payments. Generally, uh, we we make those payments uh, throughout the first quarter of the fiscal year, but uh, uh, this year by November six, um, the majority of our our contract holders received uh, payments that was the goal and and we met that for the most part and then uh, any um, any uh, contract holders uh, from 2015 to 20 to 2019 they had the option uh, to delay their payment until the next calendar year and so uh, we have uh, three or four hundred of those which uh, we will be making payments uh, by February 5th of 2021. So currently uh, we do have uh, over 2,700 active uh, CSP contracts on the books, a um, little over 5 million acres. Um, and in those uh, uh, 2,700 contracts, a little over $200 million, which is obligated. So then uh, coming to 2021, um, we do have our allocations. Uh, these are initial allocations, but uh, you can see uh, our CSP Classic, we received uh, $7.85 million to start with. And to put this uh, back into perspective, um, you know, last year we started with 10 million. And then uh, as we hope to do again this year, if uh, if if there are funds available from other states later this year uh, that they might not be able to use, um, we could pick up some additional funds. The 7.85 is where we're starting. The CSB renewal, uh, 7.8 million uh, is what we have available, and 255,000 uh, for the GCI. So the point. Uh, the thing I want to point out here is uh, uh, how many contracts we may be able to fund. Um, we had a, a CSB application uh, cutoff date this year of November 20th, and from that we had over 1,100 applications uh, for CSB Classic. So with the 7.85 million, um, we project that we will only be able to fund 7% of those applications. It, uh, it stays fairly consistent that uh, um, on average, our CSP contracts are about $100,000 a piece. So, so this is, is gonna get us about 80 contracts if we don't, if we don't uh, get increased funds this year. The renewals, uh, there again, those are competitive again. Um, so again, we expect that we could, we'll probably be able to approve about 80 of those, or about 27 percent, and we should have enough funds to um, approve all of the 70 GS GCI contracts that we get. So just kind of a heads up uh, on CSP, it's becoming a very competitive program, and uh, so um, we will encourage uh, the applicants to um, do uh, 
uh, as much as, as they can uh, to enhance what they're currently doing and those kind of things to improve their ranking scores. Uh, going on to our easements, <clears throat> kind of a quick update there. Um, thought I would give you a, a, an update of, <clears throat> of kind of what we were able, <clears throat> excuse me, to get accomplished in 2020. Uh, so we were able to uh, uh, complete nine new agreements on 1,100 acres. And in 2020, uh, our wetland reserve easements, uh, we closed 11. Now some of these, uh, you know, take a, a year or two to close. So we got 11 of those closed uh, for another thousand acres. Agland easements uh, in 2020, we were able to uh, uh, get approved one new agreement. This uh, this is a large agreement, uh, over 8,900 acres, which is up in Holt County. And so uh, we will be working over the next uh, probably year and a half uh, to get to get that completed to closing. We were able to close uh, two new uh, two ale easements um, in uh, 2020. So the uh, RCPP, um, which is our divots and pivots project out in the rainwater basin. Um, we had one new agreement for 47 acres, um, and also we had a, we closed on five uh, ale uh, easements in 2020. Again, uh, uh, through the divots and pivots for 655 acres. An update on the floodplain easements. Um, you know, still going back to our 2019 floods. Um, we. Uh, we, we initially we had about uh, uh, 30 applications, uh, 21 of those were eligible on over 5,500 acres. So to uh, enroll every one of those would take about $20 million. We did uh, receive a little over 16.5 million. So we are in the process of uh, processing those agreements and uh, taking those to closing. We're working on seven of those. Uh, there's a couple very large uh, uh, FBE applications. So uh, uh, if we can close all of those, that'll be about 4,500 acres that will get uh, closed. And we have requested the additional funds, uh, which would be needed uh, to, uh, for the rest of the applications, but we haven't, uh, we haven't received those funds yet. So we'll, uh, I'll just keep you updated on, on where that goes. So the current year in FY21, um, we did establish an early application cutoff date of October 1st for new applications. We received 37 um, by the October date on 5,300 acres. At this point, we don't have any uh, new ale applications. Uh, there are a couple potential which could still come in. Another reminder, <clears throat> Um, we we do not use the GARC uh, rate uh, process anymore, the geographic area rate caps. Um, so we are currently, uh, we'll be doing appraisals uh, for every one of the uh, uh, selected applications this year. And um, permanent easements are 100% compensated, um, but there is still the option for a 30 year easement uh, and the payment is reduced to 75%. So there is a reduction in payment. Moving on to, to equip. Um, we, I didn't uh, put together any, any slides on the specifics of the 20, uh, 20 applications and contracts, but uh, we did end up approving about 900 new ones in 2020. So currently, um, as of now, we've got 2,400 active EQIP contracts here in Nebraska on uh, 912,000 acres. The thing I would, would point out here on uh, EQIP is we, we stress uh, uh, having shorter uh, 
more specific equip contracts than, than we had in the past. Most of our equip contracts are two or three years in length. And so uh, you might remember that there were times in the past that we would we would be carrying, you know, 3,000, 3,200 equip contracts. So now 2,400 is going to be more typical. Uh, yeah, the contracts expire quicker. And then, uh, of course, we will be bringing on the new uh, contracts uh, uh, this next spring. We did have an application cutoff date of November 20th for EQIP as well. And uh, the field offices are in the process of doing the assessments, uh, doing the planning, and then uh, we will begin to rank those applications here shortly after the uh, first of the year. So I'll talk a little bit about our allocations again, and, and this is just a, a quick reminder of uh, where we're at. But we do have some mandatory uh, distributions that we must make, um, uh, you know, through statute. Uh, source water protection, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. You know, that's a mandatory 10%. Wildlife initiative, 10% uh, of our funds, historically underserved. Uh, require 10%, then livestock is now a 50% requirement that um, our general allocation, 50% uh, has to go to livestock related practices. We do, uh, again, this is, <clears throat> this is just a refresher for you, but uh, the statewide fund pools, these fund pools, which all uh, applicants can compete in across the state, um, we have the seasonal high tunnel. These are all, all carry over uh, as we discussed earlier. But I would point out there is, is one addition uh, to uh, what we had talked about previously is uh, we are now uh, required to, to set up a disaster, a fund pool uh, to reserve some funds uh, in the event that we have another flood or uh, drought or a situation where um, we want to go out with a special sign up uh, to assist, uh, you know, with these disasters. So um, it um, it's up to the states on on how much we set aside, but uh, when uh, we go back to national for additional funding for a potential disaster. Uh, it is expected that the state will match one to one with those additional funds. So if, for example, um, uh, we have a need for uh, $2 million uh, for uh, a flood or a, a drought, uh, we would be expected to contribute a million of our own uh, funding. So that is that is new uh, going into this year. So we will set up a, a separate fund pool uh, for uh, disasters potential. Now, if uh, you know, hopefully uh, we do not need <clears throat> uh, the funding for a disaster, and we hope we don't, um, at some point uh, later this year, we will roll those funds back into uh, uh, just our general uh, fund pools accounts. So this year, um, we have received our initial allocations for EQIP as well. <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> there are some special fund pools nationally. Uh, the National Water Quality Initiative. Uh, we have three projects uh, here in the state. I'll talk a little more detail about them in a minute. We, we have a 1.8 million for NWQI. Uh, our partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, through WaterSmart. This last year, uh, uh, we had two uh, projects got approved through the Water Smart, so we received an additional uh, $750,000 to uh, fund those projects. And then our uh, Forest Service project, uh, our Joint Chiefs uh, up in the Northwest, uh, this year uh, we received an allocation of $400,000 uh, for, for that project. So all in all, um, we received uh, about 21.1 million for our general allocation. And then uh, as I alluded to earlier, 
we do have some mandatory uh, uh, wildlife, historically underserved source water uh, fund fund pools, which we have to meet. And so we set up these uh, funds in a separate pool that is accessible uh, by all applicants uh, across the state. We're continuing with the AFO, and here's the disaster uh, fund pool, which I mentioned before, which we intend to just set aside a million and in case we need uh, funds for a disaster type situation. The rest of these uh, uh, we've talked about before at these uh, funding levels. So we are decreasing the HEL uh, fund pool this year slightly, and we'll probably phase that out next year. But this was to assist uh, producers with their new compliance, conservation compliance activities. And so um, uh, that's, that's just a little bit reduced. A uh, little more detail to run through this quick, really no differences here. I just wanted to uh, uh, bring it up uh, for your awareness again. Source water uh, uh, will continue this year uh, pretty much like it, it did in FY20. Uh, there were some some slight tweaks to, to the uh, priority map, but uh, generally uh, we're still going to have our, our uh, wellhead protection areas as high priority. Um, and then some of their water quantity management areas in phase two through four groundwater management areas will be medium priority. So we have about 8 million acres uh, in Nebraska, which are priority for source water. We do uh, uh, identify uh, priority practices for source water and in these uh, did not change from FY20. There's about two dozen practices which uh, uh, we're targeting uh, for source water uh, areas. And some uh, we, we can and did increase the payment rates a little bit. We can go up to 90%. Uh, I don't believe we did on, on any of these, but it is possible to have increased payment rates. And so, uh, those those will continue in 21 about like we had before. And then uh, just a reminder on our high priority practices again with 2018 Farm Bill, um, it allowed to it allowed states to identify high priority. And these are practices which uh, which uh, you know aren't typically used, but we see those as being a high priority in the state. And uh, so the 10 uh, practices, which uh, you know we've, we've discussed these in previous meetings, but there's the 10 practices which are high priority in, uh, in 2021. I'll run through a little bit on, on the uh, partnership initiatives uh, uh, programs a little bit, and uh, there'll be more discussion on some of this here in a little bit, but uh, so I'll start with RCPP, and here's a list of uh, existing RCPP projects that uh, we've had uh, going back a few years. The Regional Grassland Bird and Grazing Initiative, that, that has expired, that ended at the end of September. And then we did get one new award, uh, and uh, it was approved. Uh, from a, a 2019 announcement. And so uh, this is a resilient future for Nebraska soils. And uh, I'll show a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So uh, I'll kind of run through uh, where we're at with each one of these actives. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer Platte River, uh, that, was, that was the first uh, RCPP project uh, that we had approved in the state. And uh, that did get a one year extension, which was approved. And uh, we're currently in the process of, of uh, negotiating a new agreement for that. Uh, I say it was approved for that renewal. And so uh, we will be working hard to get that new agreement uh, in place uh, by May of 21 before, it has to be in place before the, the current agreement expires. So <clears throat> we're looking at another potential, a five-year agreement at 2.7 million. 
uh, and this is the regional grassland bird project, which which has expired uh, September 30th. The cropland cover uh, for soil health and, and wildlife. This one uh, has been uh, approved for a renewal. And so uh, we're working right now to get the uh, new agreement completed. And this expires uh, the end of this month. And so we're kind of uh, uh, short. We're going to have to work quick uh, here in December, but there's still a few steps to 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 do to get the, to get that new agreement developed. And then there again, we're uh, looking for a potential of five years uh, uh, additional for that agreement. And we're we're looking at a, a sign up yet in FY 2021. And so uh, as soon as we're able to get this agreement in place. We'll, uh, we'll have to go out with a, an announcement for a sign up in that area. Uh, the Rep Basin project, uh, we did uh, uh, receive an additional $500,000 in, in 2020 uh, for that. And we did get an extension uh, for a one, a one year, uh, no cost extension in order to uh, allow us some time to obligate uh, those funds. So that expires in August of 21. And then uh, our divots and pivots uh, project uh, on the rainwater basin uh, is still ongoing and active, uh, uh, obligating WRE uh, easements and AL easements, as I talked back in the uh, easement part, but uh, we still got another um, basically two years on on that project. Then we've got the Wahoo Creek uh, is still active and ongoing. We're working with the uh, Lower Platte North on, on two uh, dam projects there. And then uh, the Papio Creek uh, WP1 RCPP is still active and we're working uh, through that. And so, um, in 2019, there was an announcement uh, uh, for proposals. Uh, and in Nebraska, we did receive uh, four proposals, and one was uh, approved from those four. And so uh, that is, is the uh, new one I mentioned earlier uh, with uh, the Nature Conservancy. And uh, we're currently working to, to get that agreement uh, uh, completed as well. Uh, here in December. So this is uh, a look at, at that new um, RCPP project with TNC uh, out here in the Central Platte area. And uh, it's uh, we're really excited about, about what we can get done with that project. So um, there was a uh, an APF which uh, was was released for alternative uh, funding arrangements. Uh, and uh, there's a limited number of those which get a, get, they can approve every year. I believe uh, nationally they can select up to 15 each year, uh, alternative funding arrangements. And uh, Nebraska was one of, of 10 which got approved in the country. And uh, we'll be talking more about that in a minute. And then, uh, the anticipated, uh, we're anticipating another APF to be released uh, in December th this month yet uh, for new alternative funding arrangement projects. So the one project that we did get approved uh, was the Nebraska Forestry Restoration Pro Partnership. Uh, and I believe Adam Smith is gonna be giving us more details on that here in a little bit. So. Uh, uh, it's a really good project. And then uh, other announcements. Uh, uh, there was a RCPP Classic uh, funding announcement that was released back in August. Uh, the due date for proposals on that one was November 30th. And uh, I believe there, there were a, a number of, of good applications for that. So those, those uh, Project proposals are being evaluated uh, this month, and 
and into January. And the anticipated awards announcement will be in March of 2021. Talk just a little bit about uh, uh, CIG, Conservation Innovation Grant. Uh, again, there's there's two phases of, of, of CIG. There's a national uh, projects. And I'm asked uh, every once in a while um, would, you know, to know uh, if we had a list of, of projects which uh, Nebraska is a part of. So, um, so Tammy, uh, Tim's, and, and Jake, uh, they put together this slide of current projects. So this, these CIG projects were approved back in 2019, and we currently have these three uh, national SIGs in Nebraska. If uh, anybody wants or uh, would like more information, just, just shoot me an email and, um, and we can sit down and discuss them uh, in more detail. But uh, you can see a lot of these are multi-state projects uh, and uh, as you would expect with national SIGs. There is going to be uh, the announcement for uh, the 2020 SIGs uh, from that APF that went out. Uh, the awards announcement is now anticipated sometime after December. There's also the on-farm trials uh, part of SIG and uh, currently uh, here in the state, here again for a listing uh, from the 2019 on-farm trials. We have four projects. Uh, which involve uh, Nebraska and some are multi-states. In 2020, there were three uh, on-farm trial projects approved for Nebraska, where Nebraska was a participating state. And uh, as far as looking forward, uh, they do anticipate that there will be uh, additional uh, funding announcements. Uh, the, the classic, the national uh, SIG, they're, they're looking at uh, an early spring uh, release and as well as the on-farm trials. So something uh, <clears throat> uh, to keep in uh, keep in mind if if that's something you want to pursue. Um, I put the I put the uh, URL uh, to the website uh, if you're looking for more information, you know, on CIG. Uh, this is just an excellent resource uh, on uh, how it works and and kind of what it, what it's all about. I uh, mentioned our uh, VPA, our Voluntary Public Access Incentive Program. Just as a reminder, we talked about this uh, uh, before, but uh, Game and Parks uh, uh, has this VPA HIP uh, project, and uh, and so uh, uh, just a reminder on that. And then a little bit on our uh, uh, water smart program with our uh, relationship with between NRCS and uh, Bureau of Reclamation. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we do have two new water smart uh, programs uh, projects which got approved in FY21 uh, in the Middle Republican. NRD and in the Upper Republican NRD, and here's a here's a map of of the uh, Middle Republican uh, project, uh, Water Smart uh, project. It's uh, kind of in their quick response areas uh, above uh, some of their uh, streams, and then the Upper Republican is is more of an irrigation uh, water uh, project uh, for efficiency practices. So our the, the NRCS uh, connection uh, to uh, the bureau projects is uh, is where there is uh, some land management uh, activities or practices which fit uh, the NRCS equip type practices such as irrigation water management uh, uh, conversion of irrigation systems to be more efficient and those kinds of things. So. Um, there was another uh, uh, announcement for a water smart projects that went out. And I think we did distribute that out to uh, the rest of the, the committee. So uh, there again, 
If you have uh, any questions about Water Smart, feel free to, to give us a holler and uh, we'll get you with the information that you're looking for. And and here's here's a, a link to the website to get more information on the Water Smart uh, initiatives and how they will they all work. Uh, NWQI, um, touch on that quick. Uh, we so we do have the four NWQI projects uh, carrying over from uh, previous years. And there's the location. You know, we got the Bazil, Wahoo Creek, Turkey Creek, and the Big Sandy. Uh, the big change this year is. Uh, the Wahoo Creek, uh, we moved it back to a planning phase uh, to go in and uh, and update the the plan, and uh, and so there will, won't be any FA for Wahoo Creek this year. It's more of a planning phase uh, project. Uh, the map of the Brazil, and again uh, in 2020, uh, we expanded uh, the initial. NWQI project area uh, to uh, the entire groundwater management area up there. And uh, so we're looking forward to some some good results with uh, with uh, that. Uh, we set up different uh, priority areas within uh, the Brazil area, as you can see on this map. And another just look at you know, the big Sandy. Um, uh, the project areas in Turkey Creek, and again uh, the Wahoo Creek uh, map, just for your reference. So of the 1.8 million uh, that we received uh, for NWQI, uh, initially we're targeting 285 to the Big Sandy. I mentioned Wahoo Creek will uh, not have any FA this year. Uh, Bazil Creek 855 and Turkey Creek 712. Uh, so, uh, you know, significant funding, you know, for those three, and uh, so we'll be working hard to get good applications to uh, get those funds obligated. So then finally, uh, I just want to uh, give everybody a heads up of the FY21 uh, local work group meetings. Um, we have uh, sent some information out to our district conservationists, uh, already uh, and to get them uh, heads up on on uh, going to work on on uh, setting up the local work group meetings uh, across the state uh, the DCs will be working you know closely with the NRD managers uh, to uh, to find meeting times and and dates and as a reminder uh, you know this is the opportunity uh, at the local local level uh, to um, provide uh, recommendations, input, uh, you know, to the state conservationist on, you know, um, on the implementation of our different programs. And I would mention again that, you know, this isn't just equip that uh, we're looking at. I, I think traditionally you know, we think of the local work groups as giving us uh, guidance on on just equip. But we're um, we're looking for input on you know for the ASAP program and uh, CSP program and all of that uh, as far as sign up periods and and practices and and all of those things. So there the uh, the agenda items you know they they can be uh, whatever you need them to be, but some of the things we really need on a state uh, level is your priority resource concerns. What is it that you're targeting? Uh, we'll, have, we'll, we'll be looking for information on, you know, fund pools, our ranking tools, screening tools, uh, so, you know, setting up uh, those uh, uh, ranking uh, processes so that we are uh, funding those uh, most high priority applications. Uh, we need input on the practice payment schedule uh, do we have the right practices? Do we, are we paying the right amount? Um, and uh, we need that feedback. And then any local issues that uh, that are out there as well. So, so those will be coming up. Uh, uh, the uh, the process for the getting the payment schedule completed 
uh, is now on a regional and national basis. So we will need to start uh, providing input and, and doing some uh, revisions of our scenarios and practices as early as about February of next year. So the earlier uh, we can get that feedback, the better off we are. So with that, uh, I guess I would, uh, I could take a few questions now or we could take them later, but uh, that I know that was quick overview, but uh, that's all I've, I've got for now. I don't see any questions in the chat, Brad, so we can move on. OK. OK, I'll, I'll turn it back to. Uh, I guess uh, Neil Dominey is on next. All right, Brad, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. All right, um, I just want to take a few minutes. I'm going to be short. Um, I might show a couple things on my screen, but uh, for everybody in the on the call, my name is Neil Dominey, and I'm officially in a new role here at Nebraska NRCS. I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships and Initiatives. So I'm happy to work with all of you as we um, continue to, to move our conservation success in Nebraska, and I'm, I'm happy to help however I can. And that's ultimately what my job's been so far, working with Craig, is to to help him out and help others out as I can uh, with partners and opportunities and ideas. So uh, just want to let, let everybody know that I'm here and I'm available. And um, one thing that Craig asked about um, several weeks ago was you know, kind of a one pager on some of our grants and agreement opportunities. So I know Brad just hit on, kind of went into some of the details on RCPP and SIG. And I'm going to talk just a touch about uh, conservation collaboration uh, grants or agreements. But I went ahead and, and worked with Brad's staff, and we just put together a, a one pager that kind of gives expected timelines to those agreements. And we'll make that available, um, and it probably is available on the web right now, that you can just take a look at and kind of get a snapshot. And, and those are typical time frames, so they're estimates. Um, but we wanted to make sure everybody just had kind of a working knowledge of when those grants and agreement opportunities come out. Uh, as well as that, um, we did also put online um, the fact sheets. So we can, um, you can take a look at those as well. Um, and that'll give you some, uh, I, I just posted one of them here uh, for you all to take a look at. It's it's regarding the conservation innovation grants. Um, most of this is, is it's from the 2018 Farm Bill, of course, but it just gives you an opportunity to, to ask some questions to yourself. Is this the right place? Is this what I need? Um, and then ultimately we have these developed for the three programs that were mentioned. Um, this one here, the Nebraska Conservation Collaboration Grants or Agreement, this is a bit unique. Um, this is a, a more of a, a local opportunity um, and we are just working through this now to decide um, how our budget's going to look moving forward so we don't have um, this is actually the the fact sheet from last year so the the numbers you'll see in this um, is more of a, a regarding last year but ultimately we look for projects um, to leverage uh, soil health water quality uh, local wildlife species of concern um, in economic and environmental um, opportunities. So it's been a really nice way for us to work with partners here locally in Nebraska. If you want to learn more about this opportunity, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, and like I said, this fact sheet should be available um, on, our, uh, on our site. So there's three of those fact sheets there, so I encourage you to go and take a look at them. And then I'm going to share one other document here with you. And once again, this is available online. It's probably so small that um, most, of, most of you folks are like me, you're squinting and moving closer to your uh, screen to read this. Uh, but this is just that one pager that, that Craig challenges with, with putting a bunch of you know the key um, programs or grant opportunities that are out there and available to you all. So you just have some um, idea of what the timelines are. And these are all subject to change and as you can tell, um, Brad's details in his PowerPoint were more specific 
on the dates, um, but these are just more general so to make sure you understand the flow of when things do come on board. On this one pager, I did write down three names. Um, my name's right here with my phone number and email, um, and Tammy Tim's on Brad's staff, as well as Jacob Bolivin. I put down their information. Um, in the CCG, I, I will help um, in, put that together this year um, and, and move that forward. And then, of course, Tammy and, and Jacob and Brad are kind of the brains behind the SIG and the RCPP opportunities in Nebraska. But uh, feel free to reach out um, to me at any, any time, and I'll help direct your questions to, to who they need to go to. Um, and like I said, this information is all available, um, hopefully online through your packet of information and um, take a look at it. And um, if there are follow up questions, uh, we're here and available to help. Any questions on on that little presentation there? My my goal was to be brief and quick, so hopefully I hopefully I hit. And Brad and Tammy, I'm not sure who's next on your agenda. Well, I don't see any um, questions. Oh, go ahead, Brad. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, same. I, I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, thanks, Neil. And uh, Adam uh, Smith, are you uh, ready? Yes, I am. Okay, thanks. We're a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you want me to share my screen, or how how can I show the presentation? If you can, Adam, I'm going to have you try to show it on yours. Um, if you can't get it, then I'll share it from my side, and you could just tell me when to hit next. Sounds good. All right, can we see it? Is that yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, give a, some background information about the, the RCPP that we did receive, um, the Nebraska Forest Restoration Partnership, and this is a, a good segue, um, I guess, from Neil's comments. And Neil, I really appreciate the help that I have received or the, the project has received from uh, both Jacob Bliven and Tammy. Um, I think it's, it's pretty invaluable. Um, there were excellent resources, or specifically Jacob, during their proposal development, and um, they've both been very helpful as we work our way through the PPA. So I uh, wanted to, to pass that along. Um, so this is the, the Nebraska Forest Restoration Partnership, and the emphasis of the, the program is really the partnership. This is a, a recognition that uh, there is it really not a single entity in Nebraska that has the ability, uh, whether it's the finances or the staffing capacity, to be able to address these significant challenges that we do have in the state. Um, and so this is an opportunity really to bring those groups together and work um, sort of hand in hand towards addressing some of the key issues that we see uh, throughout Nebraska. Those key issues or key challenges that were identified are the lack of forest regeneration, um, shifting forest composition, um, specifically the, the dominant species that we are seeing in our oak and our cottonwood forests, the loss of rural tree canopy, which we are uh, sort of visualizing through the, the decline of windbreaks and the, I guess the removal of windbreaks and general decline of windbreak condition. Providing a little bit of background, um, in Nebraska, we, we view this as really having two uh, major resources uh, that we deal with. So we have our traditional forests that um, everyone is very familiar with throughout the state along our riparian corridors and then some of our um, geographic regions like the Pine Ridge and the Lust Canyons and, and Wildcat Hills. But we also have this secondary resource that until recently, we've really struggled to be able to quantify, which the US Forest Service has dubbed the trees outside of forests. Um, essentially, these are um, smaller stands of forests, smaller forest systems or tree systems, which do not meet the specifications, the measurements to qualify as a official forest stand, um, whether it's based on size or stocking rate. 
Um, but in Nebraska, we have about 1.4, 1.5 million acres of traditional forest and about 1.2, 1.3 million acres of trees outside of forests. And so um, really addressing one and not the other is, is really um, not impacting the, the whole resource as we see it. So this program is targeted at addressing both of these concerns, which is going to be a challenge, but addressing both of these concerns simultaneously, um, at least working towards addressing some of those issues. So the, in the oak forest, we're, what we're seeing, um, thinking our, our traditional oak forests in the east um, have, have heavily relied on fire for regeneration, whether that's keeping, keeping our canopies open, allowing more sunlight, uh, reducing competition, um, and we're, we're not getting that. Um, I think we, we've had some, some su successes at smaller scales from some of the work that is being done by Gaiman Parks. Um, and we wanted to, to enhance that work by not only um, supporting their work with the prescribed fire, but then also increasing mechanical management of these forests, which is a, a significant concern across the entire eastern U.S. Um, is really what does the future of our oak forests look like? Uh, in the absence of our traditional fire, we, we are seeing that red, ce red cedar is pretty well uh, uh, moving into these areas. And our composition is shifting from that oak overstory more towards uh, hackberry and red cedar, both um, sort of shade tolerant species. And really the, the forest inventory data is showing us the same, where we have very little, um, almost negligible uh, regeneration of seedling sized trees um, and a significant component of all seedlings that, that we find in the oak forest around the state are hackberry and red cedar. And so not a lot of, of optimism in the, in the future as far as keeping our oak forests as oak forests. Um, this is a significant emphasis for, for this program. Similarly, with our cottonwood forests along our uh, forests and our rivers and streams, um, that really the, the lack of the natural processes that kept these forests as cottonwood forests, um, we've seen that same shift um, from cottonwood dominated forests towards these same shade tolerant species of hackberry, uh, elm and red cedar. Um, in these situations, again, red cedar is managing and we, we see the same sort of carpet of uh, really non-target uh, seedlings coming in that, that are able to survive underneath that, that closed canopy and is really reducing the, the regeneration of our cottonwood seedlings. Um, an interesting note from whether you're looking at the oak forest side or the cottonwood forest, um, they're both shifting more towards the middle of the shade tolerance. And so that's signaling to us, you know, the loss of that diversity that we do have in our traditional forest stands um, with a natural management strategy, um, shifting towards, you know, the, the hackberry hardwoods um, that we're seeing more prevalent today. So both of these signaled a, a significant need for some attention um, across the state, or at least in our priority areas. Uh, in addition to the, the is issues that we are seeing in our forests, um, we have started to see uh, windbreak decline. We have been seeing windbreak decline for a long period of time. Um, as many know, we, we had large scale planting efforts beginning in, in the 1930s. Um, leading to really continued age-driven decline, um, simply those trees becoming, you know, 80, 90 years old, um, given the, the stress of being out in the open and, and some of the challenges that they see, whether it is pest and disease or climate variability, specifically drought, um, these windbreaks are over-maturing um, and not being replaced. So, um, it's it's the component of the program is really the reforestation or, or recovering that lost tree canopy however we can whether it is through new windbreak establishment or simply uh, conservation tree planting in general um, so those are really the the key issues that we're trying to address with this program so the financial assistance being offered through the program again this is the afa or the alternative funding arrangement um, version of RCPP. So as opposed to a uh, producer signing up for EQIP to gain access to the funding, um, there is no EQIP sign up required. Um, as, as there is no EQIP sign up, 
Um, it functions more as a continuous and open enrollment program where uh, the technical service providers, or, or in this case, Nebraska Forest Service staff, NRD staff, Game and Park staff, um, meet with the landowner, ensure that it checks the boxes for um, the issues that we are trying to address um, and some other things that, that we'll get into. And the, the project can essentially begin after the appropriate plans and agreements are in place. So um, the practices that we will be funding through this program are forest stain improvement, um, fence, so more exclusion fence, no, not boundary fence, um, trying to protect those areas where maybe we do have significant regeneration um, is where we wanna emphasize the use of fence. Tree and shrub establishment, windbreak, establishment and renovation and tree and shrub site prep. Um, how this will work is forest stain improvement and fence will be funded at um, sort of the 50% of the estimated cost of the practice. Um, really what we'll be using is, is the Nebraska NRCS payment schedule. Um, so not, re not significant adjustments to that schedule or the price of the practice. The um, innovation here is that continuous open enrollment um, and not having to, to wait for an equip ranking. Those practices will require a what's called a forest stewardship management plan, which is a U.S. Forest Service mandated um, sort of a property level plan. Um, also a practice plan, which is a little bit more detailed and provides the specific practice, um, uh, I guess, specific silvicultural guidelines for how that forest should be managed to achieve the, the goals and then a financial agreement that will be with the Nebraska Forest Service directly. Um, tree and the, I guess, all of the windbreak and uh, tree and shrub practices will um, largely be funded at 25% of the expected cost, really, um, based off of that local docket. And the goal is, is for this is to be supplemental cost share on top of existing uh, NRD programs. And so it's really leveraging that um, that financial assistance that the NRDs are providing, adding some, some supplemental cost share on top of it, um, and hoping to jumpstart some of these practices. Um, there are a few exceptions to this, but uh, largely it will be used as a 25%, and whether an NRD is able to contribute an additional 25% or an additional 50%, um, really boosting the financial assistance that's available to land. Yeah. Going over the partners in the roles, um, really the, the goal here is, again, to leverage that statewide network of natural resource providers, uh, making sure that we're meeting the needs of landowners and the, of the state. So the partnership that we have um, is the Nebraska Forest Service, the Nebraska Game and Parks, and the, the red NRDs um, chose to, to participate in the program. Um, the Essentially, the, the goal is, is the program is going to be statewide um, in impacts at, at, in one way or another. Um, the priority for, for year one is these, these participating landowners or these participating NRDs. Um, if there is interest from NRDs that did not um, choose to or did not have the opportunity at the time to, to participate in the program, um, do reach out. There, there might be an opportunity to to get involved maybe a little bit later in the program. So um, the, that's one thing that has been a benefit for this program. Uh, working with NRCS is the flexibility that has been afforded to us um, and, and how we set up these agreements. So um, this is the initial program, uh, the initial partnership, I should say. Uh, the NRDs um, are going to be the lead implementation partners for the tree planting practices identified there, the windbreak practices and the tree and shrub. Um, so what they will be doing is utilizing their, their local docket, um, whatever their NRD contributions are, their, their existing NRD uh, financial assistance. Some are making some, some slight edits to that, um, but it's really their existing programs or existing processes and providing simply additional uh, FA. So what that does is that reduces the, the burden of, um, I guess, the Nebraska Forest Service as far as trying to get this funding out to producers using those networks and those those relationships that already exist throughout the NRD and also providing, uh, hopefully driving more business to those NRDs as far as uh, tree planting. So 
Um, really a good a, a good partnership. Um, significant contributions from all of these NRDs, and we look forward to to working a little bit more closely with uh, with each of these partners. The Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and NFS, we will work together to uh, offer the uh, forest and improvement and the fence practices. Um, those will work a little bit differently. Again, we're kind of running two programs a little bit simultaneously here, but uh, we identified um, strategic priority areas for the program based on both uh, the Nebraska Forest Service priority forest landscapes as identified in our forest action plan and then the uh, biologically unique landscapes from Gaiman Parks. Um, working within those areas, um, the Gaiman Parks and NFS will both serve a little bit as uh, technical assistance providers to landowners in a little bit different capacity. Um, and we'll get into that in a second, but uh, these practices will essentially use the statewide NRCS payment schedule uh, for, Im for implementing fence and uh, forest and improvement. We are gonna make some adjustments to the components of those practices that we wanna fund. Again, we don't wanna do boundary fence or anything like that. So we wanna make sure that the components of the practices that we're gonna be implementing are helping us achieve the goals of the program. Uh, but largely the costs and, and that sort of thing essentially would be just implementing the, the standard practice at the standard rate just with more flexibility. So breaking down the, the duties a little bit more specifically between the two, um, again, that forest stewardship management plan is a um, US Forest Service mandated property level, all stands forest management plan. So when we walk onto a property that's 600 acres, has 400 acres of timber, we're only trying to work in 100 acres or so, um, we are developing a forest management plan for that entire property. Um, providing simple observations of, of those stands that are maybe non-target, but also could use some additional assistance or, or additional management. And so uh, by being there on site, um, a landowner may not be considering what needs to be done in other stands. They may be looking at something else, but we are still providing information about all stands. Um, those are developed and will continue to be developed in an online program called the Stewardship Mapping and Reporting Tool, SMART. Um, so those will be developed by the Nebraska Forest Service. The next step um, is using those recommendations from that forest stewardship management plan um, is this, what we call a practice plan, which is a project specific management plan for uh, specific stands on the property. And this will provide detailed management prescriptions um, as well as information that can be used in the event that a contractor is going to be used um, to sort of bid the project out to, to those contractors. Um, this will also be developed in an a online portal, um, which will both which will be able to be accessed by both NFS and Gaiman Park staff. Um, this is something that hopefully is going to be developed here, or have our first round of review in the next couple of weeks. Um, but really trying to make sure that we have a, a single tool that's available to all partners to be able to provide this, um, not only to to better um, standardize the process a little bit and make sure that, that it's getting implemented the same across the state, but also to help us in providing those financial reports or those uh, progress reports throughout the program. Um, so both organizations will have access to the practice plans. Um, the financial agreements for the uh, forest stain improvement and the fence will be directly between the, the landowner, the producer, and the Nebraska Forest Service or UNL. Um, which uh, which we are a part of. Um, so because that's a financial transaction um, that will be led by the Nebraska Forest Service, we have a, uh, a one or two page uh, financial agreement that uh, is very similar to what the NRDs use currently or what, what is available through NSWCP. Um, we use it in our fuels program and have for decades. Um, so uh, kind of pretty quick and quick and dirty uh, financial agreement, and then we'll gather the W-9 and all that necessary financial information. Uh, but once we have a, a program or a, a project that has a management plan, has a practice plan, and the financial agreements, it's really doing what um, each organization does best, and that's providing guidance to the contractors or to the landowners um, and helping them get that work done as was directed in the, um, the practice plan. 
And once the contract or once the project has been completed by the contractor or by the landowner, um, both uh, Game and Parks and NFS staff would be able to certify that project as yes, um, this, this meets the specifications of what was required and um, lay a GPS track out there so that we know that you know, we did 10.7 acres and we're, the landowner will be reimbursed based upon the work that was completed. Um, and then NFS and UNL will process those payments back to landowners. And so uh, kind of an overview of the, the roles of each of the organizations as they're, as they're planned for now. Um, I think the, the process should work. Again, the, the benefit here is we're using existing programming within NRDs to serve as the, um, the delivery for the financial assistance and Game and Parks and NFS are using the processes that we use for our wildland urban interface and our has fuels, uh, fuels reduction grants um, to implement a new type of forest management in an area where we really lack the resources to be able to provide this kind of assistance. And so um, it's really using the strengths of all the organizations. NRCS being a part of this as well, um, we'll have uh, the, the role, I guess, of verifying landowner eligibility uh, for both highly erodible lands and wetland conservation compliance, um, fence and forest stewardship, or I'm sorry, uh, forest and improvement will have a um, historically underserved payment rate, which will be 75% rather than 50% for uh, historically underserved uh, producers and so the certification and the, the verification of that status will be uh, will come from NRCS and then also providing and um, I guess creating new farm track numbers as necessary for the landowners to participate. So I um, think that that was the goal of the program is is um, you know put NRCS money to work towards the benefits of NRCS and producers and other natural resources agencies um, and I think this is a, a good way of, of getting that in there with little um, or with, I guess, reduced um, effort necessary from NRCS um, as far as staffing. So a um, little bit of a little bit of a tie still in here, um, but we'll still play a pretty significant role throughout the project. Um, a, a second component of this, which doesn't um, often get shown in the TA or the FA side of these grants is the landowner outreach and then the capacity building within Nebraska's natural resource professionals. Um, so first on the landowner outreach, and this is a, a heads up for these kind of events that are gonna be going on hopefully very frequently. Um, you know, tree and forest management goes beyond simply just, I wanna manage my forest, um, how much can I get per acre? Um, it really goes to trying to engage these landowners in forest stewardship, help have them understand the benefits and the justifications for why managing their forests towards their goals um, is important, and also empowering them to make confident management decisions. Um, you look on the right, um, there's this is information from the National Woodland Owners Survey for Nebraska uh, forest landowners, and what this shows is this is the number of acres represented by landowners who provided this kind of this specific response. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but this top table up here, um, there were 1.2 million acres of land that were represented based on the responses that um, the survey received. And so essentially um, the people who responded to the survey controlled 1.2 million acres of forest land. So. Um, the people who controlled 145,000 acres said that they have implemented a management plan. Um, almost a million acres represented of those landowners said that they did not implement a management plan. So uh, we don't know exactly why they didn't implement, um, but Nebraska being a non-forestry state, typical non-forestry state, um, there, you can assume that there's some lack of understanding of what they're supposed to be doing to achieve what they want to see. Um, in the bottom right here, what we see is the question was asked, if you don't have a management plan, why not? And um, a significant component came back and said that I don't need one or want one. Um, but some of the other justifications, you know, 50,000 acres said that they were too busy. 75,000 acres said it was too expensive, even though it's a, a free service. And 50,000 said it was too complicated. Um, so that would tell me that we have a significant component of the forest that could provide or would be interested in a forest management plan, um, 
if there were service providers or maybe they had a better understanding of the importance of it. So the goal is, is to address what, at least what the data tells us as far as landowners involvement and engagement in forestry by providing these, these hands-on tech transfer workshops, um, basic forest management, you know, emphasizing forest management for wildlife habitat or forest management for timber production. Um, and then these walk in the woods, sort of showcasing projects as they are planned or as they're being completed and really building. If we have one landowner who has an interest or who has successfully completed a project, we're going to invite the neighbors and, and really see if we can use uh, one small success to create um, sort of a landscape scale by working out from those successes. Um, so this is, I think, the partnership that we have is is very capable and will be very successful at this side of the, the uh, landowner outreach and really getting more empowered landowners to make management decisions. So um, really excited about that. And then also the statewide capacity uh, for providing forestry expertise and, and information. So forestry is not a common specialty across our natural resource agencies, um, or again, as I mentioned earlier, for Nebraska landowners. And so um, as a result of that, and then we know that there have been significant hiring efforts, uh, a lot of recent hires, whether at NRCS or the Nebraska Forest Service or Gaiman Parks, NRDs, a lot of new staff and all of these organizations who may not have the classical training of forestry or may not have a significant uh, exposure to forestry as maybe they have in the past. Um, and so the goal is to increase the capacity of Nebraska's natural resource professionals to identify management needs to meet landowner goals and then also prescribing those activities. Um, a secondary benefit that um, I think is not often discussed is the importance of increasing collaboration and interaction between organizations. Just the ability to sit at a meeting, which right now I think anybody would sit at any in-person meeting that they possibly could. But um, sitting next to these people, having conversations, better understanding what they're doing um, is, is, a, is kind of a, a non-spoken about, but, but very important component of these relationships between these organizations. Um, on the right, what we're looking at is who, if you have a management plan, who wrote your management plan? Um, the, the takeaway, there weren't a ton of responses here, but um, for those who did answer, um, they were relying on state or lo local government foresters, natural resource professionals, essentially to write those plans. And so if that is the, the single most um, relied upon plan writer, um, it would make sense for us to make sure that we have competent and, and effective and um, up-to-date people and natural resource professionals across the state writing those plans. And so um, we're going to be providing some technical training for natural resource professionals. Um, not simply a NFS or is talking to you, uh, but really leveraging the expertise of NFS, NRDs, Game and Parks, NRCS, the Forest Service. Um, you know, what can you do well? What are you good at? Okay, now give us some examples and, and host a training for us. Um, to, to make sure that we all have what we need to, to really meet the needs of landowners. Um, a plug for um, an up, upcoming online windbreak series, I guess we're, we're calling it the windbreak short course. Um, beginning in either late January or early February, we're gonna do um, on four consecutive afternoon, four consecutive, I think Wednesday afternoons, um, we're gonna be doing um, three to four hour windbreak trainings um, from everything from uh, you know, basic design, understanding the importance of windbreaks, how they work, how they function, um, some of the social interactions between windbreaks and landowners. Um, and that is currently being developed by Doak Nickerson, uh, Jay Seaton, Pam Bergstrom, and Rich Woolen on our staff. Um, several people here may, be, may have been or may already or may soon in the future be contacted about helping uh, host that event. Um, again, the, the target is natural resource professionals. Uh, Nebraska natural resource professionals specifically, and if the, the room allows, um, open it up a little bit broader beyond that. Um, so it's, it's really creating this, this network of people who feel confident providing forestry or forest management recommendations. The current status, so where we are and where we're going as far as this grant uh, relates, we have had significant interest from NRCS, from Game and Parks, from NRDs, from landowners who are hearing about it. Um, so we know the demand is out there for the program. 
Um, now it's it's sort of getting getting the the prep work and the administrative stuff to the finish line to make sure that we can um, get this get this funding out here yet this spring or late winter. So um, we are reviewing uh, the programmatic partnership agreement. So that is in process uh, in the exhibits that come with that. Um, NRDs are providing, we provided a um, sort of a partnership data collection form, um, which simply says, who's the program contact? Uh, what's your cost share breakdown gonna be? Specifically, what practices are you going to fund? Uh, because not all NRDs fund the same practices, which is perfect. The, the goal was not necessarily to um, hamstring somebody by making them fund a practice they haven't been. It's what are you doing? How can we help um, increase the success of that? Um, so providing that kind of information and then giving us that cost docket that we're going to be using for the 2021 program year. And then um, I have conversations starting tomorrow about how are we going to really do some outreach and promotion of the program. Um, NFS is, is already putting together some publications on windbreak renovation and managing your woodlands that will play a pretty significant role in this. Uh, but now it's how do we contact those landowners and or those producers and um, let them know that this funding is available. And we've already had a, a round of advertisements in some NRD newsletters, but uh, I expect that to continue in the future. NFS and Game of Parks are already identifying projects. have already been approached by uh, forest landowners about forest and improvement projects. And so um, even though we're not ready to commit financial assistance, uh, we're not able to commit financial assistance, um, things like stewardship plans and practice plans can already become or start to be developed. Um, those are plans that would, would really need to be developed regardless of the funding source. And so uh, we can get a, a jump on that. Um, the online portal is in development. I hope to have, again, a draft of that here in a couple of weeks. And we will invite um, Game and Parks to, to come and take a look at that with us so that we, we can kind of get some feedback from both organizations. As I mentioned earlier, the windbreak training, uh, that technology training series, um, and the, the significant early interest from landowners, producers, and partners about this program. So obviously there's some momentum towards what this program is, is trying to do, which is excellent and, and very reassuring uh, to see this early in the program. So future outlook, and I hope I'm probably end up biting my tongue a little bit here, but um, the hope is that we can turn around the PPA and the um, supplemental information here in the next 10 days back to NRCS. Um, I know there's an initial review and then a bunch of holidays, um, but hopefully uh, maybe very early the next year, we can um, think of maybe end of January for some optimism, um, get the, the agreements in place and really start uh, moving the program along in earnest. Um, we can continue identifying projects for projects and planning those projects for future cost share. So spring 21 windbreak plantings, those, um, you know, the, the agreements with the NRDs can already begin because that was, that'd be a standard agreement between the producer and the NRD. The planning can begin for those. Um, education or, or outreach and promotional information, the goal is to get, uh, whether it's a hand, uh, I guess a hard copy set to partners or digital information to partners to be disseminated however is best for that group. Um, we, we plan to provide that kind of information. Um, and we'll, we would bring other people in too to, to assist with developing that. Um, and then uh, early January or sometime in January, we want to provide some training to Game and Parks on developing that practice plan. Um, not really a how, here's how you develop a practice plan um, as their staff have been doing it for, for a very long time. Um, but making sure that they understand the format that, that the plans will be in, understand the process of certifying projects, um, documenting or how we will be documenting project progress and then working with the NRDs individually um, to make sure that we have a plan for them submitting their reimbursements to us. So the NRDs, if they provide a 50% cost share traditionally, will provide that additional 25% on top out of their own pocket, um, track the project progress. At the end of the tree planting year, they will invoice the Nebraska Forest Service for their total of extra cost share that they had provided. So as opposed to however many thousands of agreements that NFS would have to have with producers, now we are reimbursing 16 or 17 NRDs at the end of the tree planting year. So trying to be pretty efficient um, and that helps us out with the paperwork that we have to do with NRCS as far as annual allocations to NFS to make sure that we can meet the obligations in the field. So, um, you know, really, a, a hopefully a, a pretty slick process that we can put together to make sure that no one's really left out to dry or, or holding the bill for too long. So. 
And I think that is all I have. Are there any questions about the program? Uh, Adam, uh, there are a few questions uh, in the uh, chat. I'll I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and read them for you, and then uh, the person that asked them, you know, if you want to unmute and add to it, uh, feel free. But the first one I see in the chat is, uh, what percent of trees outside the forest are unwanted cedar stands? Mm -hmm. um, so that the imagery or the the data that was used for that was because it was statewide, and that's one meter imagery. Um, so that's something that is available to or one meter vegetation classification that's available to anybody. Um, but that is a, um, all it does is it shows whether it's treed or not treed. And so we don't have information about the composition of those trees outside of forest. It just simply says this, these are trees compared, compared to grass or, you know, some other cover type. So we don't have that level of data. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, it says, will, will use of eastern red cedars be limited in this program or even prohibited in some parts of the state? So what we are going to be doing, um, as it's NRCS funding, what we're doing is we are following the policies that were put in place last year for eastern red cedar use. Um, and we're leaving it up to those NRDs to implement their windbreak establishment, their conservation tree programs based on how they already would. Um, so. Um, the, the guidance came down from Craig, uh, I think it was early last year, or maybe it was this year, it's so long ago. Um, but uh, that's the, the edict that we will use as far as when and where is appropriate to use red cedar. And then further details go down to the NRD, whether or not their NRD chooses to cost share on planting of red cedar. So um, no new restrictions, no new changes based on um, just because of this program. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, will chemical treatment be used in forest stand improvement? Yes, that will be a, a component that's that's fundable um, as a part of forest stand improvement. Okay, a second part uh, of that question is that why is the Missouri River not part of the Cottonwood priority area? given the massive loss of cottonwood forest from the Missouri River floodplain? Mm -hmm. um, so what we have, um, so these are um, the priority areas, sort of the, the Platte River or the watershed boundaries a little bit, I guess you just call them the, the river systems. Um, there is no distinction between which one is an oak priority area or which one is a um, cottonwood priority area. So. Uh, the Missouri River was identified, as was the Elkhorn, the Loop, the Platte, Republican, the Blues, and the Nemahaw. So um, funding is absolutely eligible for the Missouri River. Okay, um, next question. So Dr. Twidwell highlighted the central grassland strategy during the last state technical committee. This presentation highlighted priority areas for control of eastern red cedar. Will these priority areas be lower priority for windbreak renovation? If we are expanding EQIP to control Eastern Red Cedar, would it not make sense to not expand additional fund, expend additional funds to renovate the seed source in these priority landscapes? Um, we're, we are not making any sort of a, a, a specific guidance or changing how these programs work based on Eastern Red Cedar. Um, if funding the, the establishment of windbreaks and including Red Cedar is a, an allowable practice within NRCS and within the NRD, um, we are not going to make our, make, we're not going to impress maybe different priorities upon these local organizations. So if it's a priority for an NRD to plant windbreaks and red cedars, the best tool that they have, we're not going to tell them that they can't do that in their own NRD. Um, that's kind of how that, what that boils down to. Okay. Uh, next question says, uh, maybe it's a comment. I hope your technical training series is recorded and will be available for public use. Absolutely. Um, actually, what we're looking to do is so 
um, because of the, you know, it's a kind of a, a significant time block in the afternoon and four consecutive days. What we're looking to do is actually have the presenters record their presentations. Um, I think we're going to cap them at 40 minutes, uh, record their presentations. Those will be um, provided during the presentation or during the technical workshops if they are not able to be there in um, in person. And then there'll be some time for discussion. And those actual the actual presentations and discussion will be recorded and those will be sent out so essentially you will will have been able to sit at that um that workshop and hear all the discussion um we've had other states who have expressed a lot of interest in attending these um but we kind of want to cap this at least initially at nebraska natural resource professionals and and producers and landowners and so um we, we aren't gonna really have out-of-state people as a part of that if, if that's an issue anyway, uh, but they will be able to view the recorded. And if someone is not able to attend, they can also um, view the recorded information. Okay, good. Um, the next question uh, we may have, have already addressed, but uh, uh, the person that asked it, you know, jump in if, if not. But the question, uh, that do we need a clear policy on eastern red cedar in Nebraska that applies across all NRCS related programs so that all programs work together seamlessly? And you kind of touched on uh, the guidance that uh, Craig released last year, but uh, anything more you want to add? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. You know, we're working within the boundaries of the NRCS programs that we have available to us. And so um, that's what we're that's what we're trying to stick with. Yeah, and then I guess I would would add too that uh, if we need to uh, resend out uh, the policy, um, you know, just contact us directly, and uh, it might be something we can go over again or discuss. Okay, next question. Um, okay, eastern red cedar and shade tolerant species were identified as one of the major threats to cottonwood gallery woodland savanna communities as part of this presentation. Is there a potential buffer distance for eastern red cedar plantings windbreak renovation away from riparian woodlands to try to limit eastern red cedar invasion into these priority forest communities? Um, so I, I think what this touches on is maybe um, this is an opportunity for us to look back at things like the uh, field office technical guide for best management practices or the processes of establishing a windbreak. Um, you know, if part of establishing a windbreak in one location is taking in, into consideration, part of doing any natural resource practice in one location is taking into consideration the potential impacts on other non-target natural resource uh, uh, issues. And so, um, you know, I don't know if a specific buffer would make a difference. Um, you know, I think you'll get various um, various answers on how far those the the seed will will spread and and you know how far away from a windbreak it might be an issue um another concept too is you know if you're doing anything within you know a tree planting in a you know right next to the missouri river sorry the uh, platte river in the central part of the state um you know how much of an impact is that windbreak going to be having on red cedar in the area when there's red cedar already in the the riparian forest so um yeah, I, I think this opens the door for some discussions about how can we maybe update that. You know, we, we're also looking at um, things like utilizing um, Rocky Mountain Juniper as maybe a replacement when it can be for red cedar in certain areas. Um, the issue that we're seeing in that case is um, it's being used exactly how red cedar was being used. And we're starting to see some cercospora issues across the state because of the wet spring we had. We're starting to get some fungal issues which is not a concern with red cedar, uh, typically not a concern for red cedar. And so um, as we're doing things like trying to adjust how we can put a windbreak on the landscape is really our goal is uh, establish these, these tree systems. Um, as we're adjusting those based on the, the different pressures and, and different ideals that people have, um, making sure we're not putting ourselves into a situation where we're creating another issue in the future. Um, so I think that, that there's gonna be a time and a place for really have, um, to, to really have those discussions about how can we rethink this? How can we update the, the process for developing or for installing a windbreak with trying to have as little negative impact as possible, um, depending on uh, people's views? 
Okay, there there was a second part to that question. Uh, you touched on it just a little bit, but could the buffer be used to adjust or limit the amount of cost share available? Uh, you know, I guess depending on whether or not that was something that was deemed as um, having a benefit. Um, I, again, that that's out of, in, in our program, um, we will not have that sort of a, a practice guideline. Um, whether or not that's something to, to be developed or considered in the future is kind of out of my wheelhouse a little bit. Okay, then final uh, question in, in the chat, and then we'll open it up to the phones. Um, do not red cedars spread by birds sitting in trees, so buffers are not workable. Um, to try and, I guess, understand that. Um, reds, yeah, birds are the significant uh, component to or provide the, you know, the, the really the vector for spreading red cedar berries around the state um, or, you know, from a, a seed source. Um, the question is, is, you know, does, does establishing a windbreak that has cedar in one area, um, does that contribute to a significant issue if the area already has, you know, 80,000 acres of red cedar forest? Um, you know, there's a benefit, a certain benefit provided by that windbreak. Um, and there's an applied management that goes with installing a windbreak. Um, you know, do we remove that ability from a landowner or producer to be able to establish a windbreak to benefit their property just because, uh, you know, there's 80,000 acres of uncontrolled cedar elsewhere. So, um, yeah, that's a, a pretty deep discussion that uh, we intentionally stayed away from in this program. Um, you know, it's a, a, a big program addressing significant issues using local preferences and, and local ideals, uh, not trying to, to impose any different changes on some of these NRD partners. Okay, well, that was uh, all the questions in the chat. I guess I'd open it up now. Uh, anybody want to unmute and ask any questions uh, while we're on on the uh, Forest Service uh, RCPP? Okay, well, I'm not seeing any or hearing any, Adam, so thank you uh, for that. That was a very good overview. Thank you very much. Um, excuse me? Um, I've got a question um, as far as management of uh, the red cedar and perhaps even uh, other um, unwanted trees. Um, what about uh, the use of uh, goats or sheep or uh, those kind of uh, stock in order to graze the uh, blueberries and to remove the trees that have the blueberries, which are the female trees, so that, that you're removing uh, amount of production of the seed uh, for the red cedars. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, you know, something that's been used at certain small scales. I believe some of it has been done in south central part of the state and probably elsewhere. Um, you know, when um, the trees are small enough and the, the management is early enough. Um, you know, that's a kind of a little bit of a, a double benefit there in that, um, you know, we've got uh, the potential, you know, you're increasing browse for a livestock animal while dealing with a significant natural resource issue. Um, I think that's, that's a crucial management option. Um, the question is, is can we get that done early enough in the life cycle to where it can actually be effective? I guess that would be the challenge is to implement that when the trees are small. Well, I think that the uh, trees can be easily uh, eliminated and uh, with uh, poly um, electric fencing, um, a herd of goats would be uh, very effective at uh, removing the berries off the tree uh, and around the ground, uh, especially during the winter, uh, as a means of uh, eliminating the seed stores uh, that are being produced. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that the challenge, I guess, would be is keeping browse to just the berries. Um, you know, they're going to want to take that whole tree, which in most cases, if it's a, an open pasture um, and you're starting to see some red cedar, that that's kind of what you want. So. 
um, you know, you're you're hoping that the goats goats would be taking more than just the berries if you're really trying to knock it back in that in that area. Um, like you said, intense grazing with browse animals would probably would maybe a, a good solution for that. Um, the question would be scale um, and how how much you can can get done. Um, in a certain amount of time. So, and I, I about expended the extent of my knowledge about uh, grazing with browse animals. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Adam. I think we'll, we'll move on. Uh, you know, if there are any other questions out there, feel free to email them in or uh, at the end, we'll, we'll have a, a chance for a few more uh, questions at that time. So, so thank you, Adam, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and move on down our agenda. Uh, as Craig mentioned uh, at the opening, um, we're going to have Carlos Villarreal uh, join us and uh, talk a little bit about the soils and wetland compliance and GIS the technology. And uh, so, Carlos, are you uh, are you ready to go? Thanks, Brad. I think so. I'm going to try to share my screen. That's okay. Sure, I believe everybody can see that. Um, yep. So uh, thank you, everyone, for letting me uh, present this afternoon. Like everybody said, I'm the new state soil scientist. I've been here since October. So I'm still trying to understand the lay of the land while while being quarantined and locked up, and it's uh, it's it's been a little difficult not being able to go to the field and 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 see what we're doing here in Nebraska. But um, I've got confidence that that soon that will be a possibility, and and I look forward to taking advantage of that. Uh, so, like Brad said, I'll be giving a, just an update on on the soil section here and what our priorities are uh, over the next year and uh, give you a little introduction to our staff. Let's see. Screen. Okay, so the uh, the NRCS soil section, um, like I said, I'm the state soil scientist. I moved here from Texas. Uh, I've been with the NRCS for about 14 years, um, mapping soils earlier part of my career, and, and uh, I'd say the last five years have been uh, working with, with our conservation planners and with our producers to to uh, understand the soil needs of, of the state. Um, the assistant state soil scientist, Patrick Cassert was hired also this year. Uh, he's been in, in Nebraska and with, with NRCS for almost 20 years. So his, his wealth of knowledge is, is extremely useful, especially for, for me, you know, being new and not familiar with, with the soils up here. So, um, so we should be in good hands with, with Patrick on board. Um, also, I have, uh, four other soil scientists on staff that are uh, sharing their time between soils and, and doing some wetland compliance work also. So uh, that's Tyler, Riley, Alex, and Josh. Uh, the state soil section administers four programs for NRCS. We handle all the technical soil survey uh, soil service requests. Uh, that could be helping a field office with, uh, with a request they have or um, going to the field, working with uh, with partners, just trying to resolve some of the soils, um, the soil questions that we have. Uh, the soil health program also, wetland compliance and geographic information systems. And I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation discussing those. First, I'll start with the uh, soil health program. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with our state soil health specialist, Aaron Hurd. Um, He's uh, he's been here for about five years, um, administering soil health for the state, and I couldn't be more excited on, on the projects that he has, the partnerships uh, that he's developed over the last few years. Um, coming from from Texas, it's uh, it's it's neat to see how far advanced Nebraska is with their soil health program. And um, here's a list of the partnerships that uh, that Aaron's been involved in. Um, most of the partners are, are UNL and um, uh, you know, whether it's the, the soil health clinics, the soil health conferences that have been going on for the last five years, uh, on-farm research network. Uh, it's it, it blows my mind how, how 
how great these, uh, you know, how, how far advanced these programs are. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of them, the uh, soil color and soil organic carbon relationships. That's a project with UNL um, looking at ways that we can uh, assume the soil organic carbon based on soil color. I think if we can get that tied down, that'll be a neat tool for producers, for field offices, employ for conservation planners to, to be able to go to the field and recognize soil organic carbon or a degraded soil uh, based on soil color. So. Um, the theme to a lot of these projects is is just us getting these uh, all, all this information so that we can digest it and, and make those resources available to our field staff. Um, the uh, soil gap concept, it's developing an interactive soil health research site map for Nebraska to understand soil health gap. Um, this is huge in, in giving us a benchmark of, of soil data for Nebraska. Um, the idea would be we would uh, we would have a benchmark of of what we would consider a healthy soil or a fully functioning soil, and then uh, a producer would be able to to judge their soil based on that benchmark. So uh, it's it's a really neat concept, and uh, and again, it's it's something that we think would be extremely valuable to our field staff and to our producers here in Nebraska. Um, the dynam dynamic soil properties is a uh, research oriented soil sampling um, soil health i mean it's, it's everything um, measurement study that that we do here in nebraska we do it around the, the united states here in nebraska we have 30 research sites um, these sampling projects look at organic carbon bulk density uh, these soil properties that aren't inherent so um, the things that will change uh, based on management decisions so um, the 30 research sites. I've got a, a, a map that I'll show you here shortly. Um, but this is really involved. Uh, it's, it's great to be a part of. And this adds to the amount of information that we can share with our field staff and, and producers so that we can um, really get an idea of, of how far along we've come and, and you know, how a producer is doing with, with their conservation practices. At the bottom, Nebraska NRCS Soil Health Initiative. We developed a strategic plan for our soil health section uh, almost five years ago, and we're going to renew that plan this coming year. We have we've involved a lot of partners in this. Uh, we, we basically just want to identify the areas that we're interested in so that when we do get um, interest from an outside party, we're able to share what our common interests are and what our goals are so that we can make sure that we're keeping everything um, everything all of our activities in line with our strategic plan so that's also an exciting thing for us to do this year and i have a table i'm, I'm i think i'm i was told that y'all have seen this before uh, this is the um impacts of nrcs programs on on cover crop acres uh, and if you can see my cursor maybe that'll be easier uh, in 2017 in 2008, oh gosh, in 2017, we had 747,000 acres of cover crops in Nebraska. Uh, the program dollars from NRCS contributed to 66,000 acres. Uh, roughly 9% of, of the acres in Nebraska were, um, were funded through uh, EQIP and CSP contracts. Um, in 2019, we estimate that number to be about 80,000. So we've increased, you know, 10,000 acres. And on top of that, the conservation program funded disaster recovery money from the flood from last year, uh, we were able to add an additional 42,000 acres. So we essentially have doubled our cover crop acres funded through uh, EQIP and CSP over the last three years. So that's a really exciting thing for us, um, not only in terms of our impact on, on uh, with producers and on the land, um, but also the, the the benefits of soil health, and I, I listed them here on the right. You know, added uh, organic material, fertility, uh, erosion control, water quality improvement. So uh, it, it's it's a really exciting time uh, for a soil health program, um, especially when we can we can back it up with uh, you know with our conservation our, our farm bill programs. 
I wanted to bring your attention to the um, what we did all last year uh, with our soil health impact. Um, we were able to accomplish plenty of outreach, uh, although we were having to accommodate for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you can see here the flags on the map are where we were able to either provide a, a presentation or host some kind of uh, producer group. Um, we did trainings in the field with uh, with our field staff before we were uh, before we had to reduce that. Um, and even afterwards, we were still able to get out and sample for these DSP projects and, and invite uh, one or two folks from the field office to come and uh, participate, learn how we collect the data. That way, when we come back at the end to show them what the numbers were, they're able to, to understand a little bit better of, of how those numbers were derived. The stars represent the cropland soil health study areas. Um, this was an opportunity for us to, to evaluate cover crops, uh, reduce tillage, conservation practices, um, uh, looking at um, residue management. And, and we really wanted to justify a lot of the practices that we're doing and, and be able to show the producer real values. And, and uh, by doing these DSP projects, we're able to communicate that with the producer. Uh, the red, I'm sorry, the blue plus signs, um, those are the, the rangeland soil health study areas. So in these areas, we're looking at uh, grazing management plans, we're looking at cross fencing, um, just different, uh, different ways that we can use innovation and innovative ways to, to graze and use animals to impact the soil health. Switching gears to wetland compliance, um, we hired a wetland compliance coordinator, which is uh, Corey King. He's here in the, in the state office as well. About three years ago, we created a wetland team that works exclusively on wetland determinations, reconsiderations, and uh, restoration plans. Uh, the team currently is made up with 13 biologists and, and soil scientists, um, mostly in eastern and, and central Nebraska. And uh, Nebraska receives about 2,300 wetland determinations annually. So I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, the uh, red and black lines are the, uh, the wetlands that were received and completed throughout the year. But I think the trend line is, is what's most important in this graph. And that shows that uh, we've reduced the, ba the backlog of wetland determinations. Um, from 576 in 2018 to 124. So uh, not only are we continuing to receive the same amount of requests essentially, but uh, we're also able to, to go through that backlog and, and start cleaning that up. So we've, we've had a tremendous success. Uh, the team is, is, they have all the resources during, you know, while, while the offices are, are being reduced uh, staff wise. So we're, we're still being able to be productive throughout this time. Yeah, and I want to talk about the soils, um, technical soil services in the soil section. So uh, the goals for 2021 and, and really 2022, uh, we want to increase our involvement with the MLRA offices. Uh, the MLRA offices are, are remapping soils or updating so the, the geodata or the, uh, the soils database. Um, but they hold these management and technical team meetings, give us an opportunity to provide feedback on the proposed projects that they're going to be doing. We definitely want to take advantage of those. Um, we want to go to the field once we're able to do that. Uh, look at some of the uh, proposed changes they're making and understand how that affects our conservation planning and, uh, and the users. Um, and I, like to have an opportunity for our soil scientists here in the state office to also uh, provide assistance in those as well. Um, get them involved with, with how the data is being collected and how it's populated in the database so that they have a better understanding of, of, uh, of the structure of the data. So when we do have requests on or problems, we're able to, to communicate how to fix it. Um, we also want to provide conservation activity reports. Um, and increase awareness of uh, plan practices, plan practices, and involved soil. So, 
what this really is is a, it's, it's just another tool for us to to have more input when we are when the MLRA offices are planning projects we're able to tell them uh, what conservation practices are, are being used on those soils and um, you know the, the best um, type of, of sampling methods or the best type of project depending on how how that soil data is being used uh, so we want to make that connection uh, we want to share web soil survey metrics with Nebraska leadership. Um, I hope you all are familiar with our online um, mechanism for sharing soils data, which is web soil survey. We, in the background, we collect that information on how big the uh, AOI is, area of interest, uh, what kind of reports are being looked at, and we can use that information to decide where we need to make improvements, where we can streamline some processes and, and hopefully make that customer experience a little bit easier and um, and better. I know Web Soul Survey is not the most uh, user friendly uh, platform that we have. Um, and, and they are currently looking at ways to or other opportunities to, to share souls information, but uh, currently, Web Soil Survey is is number three or four on the um, USDA, you know, used, top USDA used uh, websites right now. So it is being used, um, but there are ways that we can improve it. And by looking at those statistics, having our leadership understand how it's being used, and uh, we can really get a some synergy in, in how we um, how we tackle providing information to users and our, and our customers. Uh, we want to review current available interpretations. Um, interpretations are built by scientists and universities, and um, they, they spend a lot of time understanding soil properties and how that can be related to, um, you know, different interpretations. I guess, uh, you know, if you're going to build a house with a basement, uh, what's the best soil to do that? So we have... Um, we have the, the ability to incorporate some of those interpretations and we we want to know maybe if they need to be vetted or if, uh, if some of them can be improved. So a way we can do that is, is you know, just sitting down and, and uh, having some of our partners look at them and, and, and just kind of uh, build relationships and, and, and teams to, to evaluate those interpretations. I mentioned earlier that GIS is also a program that, that our soul staff administers, and I'm a, a huge GIS geek, so I I, I love the uh, the potential of using GIS. It's something that, that really excites me. So um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to see happen is us uh, expand the plat the online presence using ArcGIS Online, uh, ArcGIS Online or AGOL. You might have heard of it. Um, we have this platform that is easy to use, easy to understand. Um, and I, I, we want to be able to use it to show soil health and conservation planning success stories. And there may already be some from, from Nebraska, but we definitely want to expand that. Uh, we want to streamline data sharing with partners and cooperators. And I've, I've got a slide here in a, a short bit that, that demonstrates that. But it really is a good opportunity for us to, to share data in a unique way it's user friendly and interactive and uh, overall it provides for a, a, a pretty good experience. Uh, develop and implement performance monitoring tools. We have um, access to, to this uh, integrated data idea database. We have access to, to all the conservation planning. We have access to uh, dollar figures and acre, acre amounts and uh, we have all this data in a database, so we, we really want to spend some time to pull all that data out and analyze it. Uh, we, we can look at trends like uh, contract management, uh, customer service. How are, how do how do these trends in 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 our conservation practice footprint or our planning process uh, affect customer service and practice implementation? How how effective are we at at uh, writing a contract in those? conservation practices actually being implemented by our producers. So I'd like for us to, to develop a system where we can consistently analyze uh, those uh, metrics so that we can see where we need to improve our resources or um, if we have successes, how can we, how can we share those successes with the rest of the team? 
Um, we want to monitor program and high priority areas for environmental impacts. I'm not sure where I was going with that when I wrote it, but um, improve integrate infield data collection. Uh, currently, we're using different platforms to collect data in the field, and we would like to have a, an opportunity for the field offices to provide feedback. We, we'd like to make these available to producers to, to evaluate, say, a soil health assessment on their own and provide feedback. Um, if, if we're going to be spending time to create these tools, we, we also want to, to make sure that they're that they're um, vetted and and people are able to to give us their uh, their opinions or feedback. Um, and then we want to improve the training in the field. Um, we're we're a little bit uh, reduced on, on our ability to to go to the field and, and do trainings specifically. So we we need to come up with innovative ways to deliver that that training. But our field offices certainly are still going to the field and collecting data and working with producers. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're. Um, you know, they have all the resources necessary. Here's an example of the AGOL platform that I was mentioning earlier. And, um, in this situation, we have a uh, soil and water conservation district, the, the equivalent of an NRD, um, that have identified the priority resource concerns at the local work group meeting. So this is a way for us to make that information available for our partners, specifically the state uh, technical advisory committee um, to be able to find an area and visualize the, uh, the identified priority resource concerns. And in this example, uh, you know, we have the different land use categories and the top three priority resource concerns for those um, for that soil and water conservation district or, or NRD. Uh, I'm not saying we'll, we'll do that in Nebraska, but uh, I just want to to highlight that we have the capability of streamlining some of this data straight to you. So um, however you're using our information, uh, we, we want to be able to know that and understand it so that we can uh, make that data available to you in an easier way. Wow, that was quick. All right, so um, I'd, I'd like to incorporate a soil health um, talking point in all of my presentations. And uh, if, if we were in person, I'd ask for two volunteers to come up and help me with the slate test here. But um, again, another opportunity for us to, to, to think of uh, innovative ways to deliver soil health uh, trainings and, and outreach to the community. Um, in the past, we've converted these pictures to four foot tall poster boards. And you know, if we're in a situation where we can't do this live, then we'll just pull out the posters and, and ask the uh, participants what they think will happen. And then and then we do the uh, the slate test that's shown there on the right. So um, again, I'm, I'm really excited to be in Nebraska and um, I've, I've I've learned a lot about soil health, a lot about compliance um, since I've been here and I'll continue to do that. And I hope one day when we are in person, we're able to to talk shop and you can tell me about the projects that you're working on and any way that we can help and incorporate GIS or, or soil health into those projects. So I'm really excited to be here and, and Brad, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to speak. Okay, well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, I guess I would open it up if there's any questions uh, from anybody out there. Um, not seeing anything in the chat, but uh, I'll just wait just a second. Um, if anybody has any questions for Carlos. OK, well, hearing none. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, very good. And uh, if you stick around to the end, there might be some questions, more questions. But uh, at this time, I think next on the agenda is uh, <clears throat> a Farm Service Agency. And so uh, I'm not sure who is is going to uh, start that, if Doug or Jana, Levain, uh, one of you, are you on yes. and, and ready? Okay. Yes, that'll be me, Brad. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Doug Klein. I'm with the Farm Service Agency here in, in Lincoln at our state office. 
we don't have a lot to add today, but we did want to uh, recap that we currently do have a CRP sign up going on right now. We've got the continuous sign up. Number 55 is ongoing. And then in January, starting January 4th, we will have general sign up. Number 56 will be occurring, and that will go from January 4th through February 12th. And then we also, in March, halfway through March, halfway through April, we will have grassland sign up number 203. And that will be the grassland sign up will be March 15th through April 23rd. So at the moment, those are the either currently ongoing or the two upcoming sign ups that, that have been announced. Uh, we are anticipating that we will have a CREP sign up later in the year. We don't know exactly when that is going to be. Uh, we do know that one of the one of the things that is holding up announcement of the CREP sign up is we're still trying to figure out how to adjust our uh, soil rental rates for a single irrigated rental rate. We currently have been using a pivot irrigated versus a, a gravity irrigated rate. And we do have to go to a single irrigated rate. So we're still in the process of working our way through how we're going to accommodate that and, and working with the national office on what will be allowed. Uh, I did want to also highlight that last week we did have, uh, you know, the, the quick uh, tech meeting for the folks involved with the conservation priority areas. And we did get those submitted to the national office last week. Uh, that was a situation where we had a very short turnaround time with notification from the national office that we had the ability and the requirement to revise our, our CPAs. And so we did uh, take advantage of that opportunity and we did get those submitted. And then another plus that's going on right now for 2021 the practice incentive program or the PIP payments that we've had in, in some of the CRP signups uh, with the announcement of the uh, 2018 Farm Bill and the process of adjusting and, and applying those changes with that Farm Bill to the CRP process, the uh, PIP payments had gone down to 5%. But we did find out recently that for 2021, that PIP payment rate is going from 5% up to 20%. So that's great news for that. That'll make that certainly more attractive than when it was being held to the 5%. Um, one last item that I had was our SAFE project. Uh, there's been a number of adjustments with the SAFE projects on a national basis. And with those adjustments, uh, the current SAFE proposal that we submitted back last June or early July of 2020, the adjustments that have been made under the uh, new, with the national level of, of in involvement in the, the SAFE projects, we decided to withdraw the SAFE project for 2021 but we do have the ability on an annual basis to uh, revise and resubmit. So we will be looking at doing that, you know, sometime in 2021 with the idea that we will have that available uh, going forward into 2022. But we, we are withdrawing the uh, safe project that we did submit uh, because we are going to have the ability to, to revise that. And there the changes that we were looking at that they were having us make really wasn't doing the benefits that we were hoping for. So our thought is, and working with uh, Eric Zock and Kelsey Werman as the main partners involved in that SAFE project, uh, as a group, we decided that let's pull back, let's withdraw that project, the proposed project, and let's revamp it and, and see with the changes that are coming or that we've gotten with the SAFE project, let's let's revise it and give it another shot for 2022. So that's the update that I've got for uh, CRP and, and FSA for the State Tech Committee. 
Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, there is one question <clears throat> in the chat. Uh, it says, what is the status of the migratory bird safe? Um, Levain, Doug, you, I, you? Yeah, this okay. is Levain. I can um, comment on that. Right now, um, with the, what we're wanting to do at Migratory Bird Safe, they pulled it because it was under a ranking criteria and it's a combination of Nebraska and Kansas together. So we had to send in different proposals or recommendations to how we're gonna rank these now, not call them a ranking process. So that was pushed in. I did get notification when they were um, giving us a deadline on our other safe, uh, the other safe that Doug, had was, Doug was talking about. And they said they will, will be looking at migratory bird safe and getting back to um, ourselves in Nebraska and Kansas to discuss what options we have or if there's any changes, which I'm sure there'll probably be some changes, and what we are going to be capable of doing to come up with basically a process to rank those again using irrigated rental rates. So right now they haven't come back and given us their positive comments, their negative comments or anything. So they're finishing up all of the other uh, safes that were kind of more the wildlife safes. This is kind of its own special safe, so they pushed us to the back burner. So we'll be hearing from National on that, but right now we don't have anything to provide you on how that's going to progress or if we will be going forward with that um, safe proposal. Okay, Levine, <clears throat> there was another question uh, in regards to that. It says, do you need any additional information from the partners for the migratory bird safe? And is there a timeline? At this time, we do not need anything. Like I said, we have not been contacted from our national office on what we submitted in with our with the with the migratory bird safe and our other safe that we pulled back on. Um, it was the pollinator safe is what we sent in. So right now, until we hear back from national, there's nothing our partners can provide or do. Um, once we do hear from them, then we'll be contacting our partners um, for that migratory bird safe to see what we need to follow up with our national office with or how we proceed. Kind of what we did on the pollinator safe with, with Eric and Kelsey. Once we got that, we visited with our partners, then we made our decision. So we'll have time to go back to our partners once we hear from our national office. But at this time, we haven't heard from them. So there's nothing I can go back to the partners on. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions in in the chat. Uh, are there any verbal questions while we got uh, Doug and Levain? Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any, so thank you, Doug and Levain. You got right, it. Thanks, Brad. Uh, okay, uh, we're kind of at the end and. Uh, Maybe I just take just a minute. Is there any overall general questions from anybody? And then I'll turn it back to Craig to wrap it up. On any any of the topics. Hey, Brad, it's Tammy. Um, yeah. Some of the people that have um, gotten on or called in, can you please email me because I don't have your names. I just have a phone number. So if you could email me your attendance, if you could, if you're still on, that'd be great. OK. OK, well, I'm not seeing any or hearing any, so Craig, uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you to uh, wrap up. All right, uh, thank you, Brad, and thank you to all of our uh, presenters today. I thought it was a um, really good discussion, a nice variety of uh, topics. You know, um, I often say we spend a lot of time talking about programs, especially farm bill programs but I like to have a balance of uh, technical issues and other conservation delivery issues. So um, I thought today's session went well. And as I said, when we began, um, these are not easy having them be virtual meetings. Uh, I know many of us um, get to be sort of zoomed out by the end of the day, 
But thank you all for what you do for conservation in Nebraska. And um, I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thank you. With that, uh, Tammy and Brad, I think we can end the recording and just uh,